Hello once again. Today's video is one that I've been really excited about. This video's been a couple of months in the making. Today we're going to take a look at a Western Electric 1A2 key telephone system. Um, but a rather unique one. Uh, my system consists of two original 1A2 telephone sets. But the key service unit is not an original Western Electric key service unit. This is actually a modern recreation of a 1A2 KSU that does everything that the originals did, but it is a modern board made of all solid state components. It's actually powered by two microcontrollers, and this is a board that was designed and is sold by a single guy as basically a labor of love. A guy who's a big fan of 1A2 systems and wanted to make a KSU that anybody could purchase and didn't have to worry about buying vintage equipment or anything like that. And uh, that's what I have here and we're gonna take a look at that in this video. So yeah, really cool setup we're gonna be taking a look at here. First of all, what's a key telephone system? Well, here's a little refresher. Uh, we've talked about them before. I own another one. Uh, the Northern Telecom Northstar is a key telephone system. A key telephone system is a basic business telephone system where you have multiple lines and multiple phones that can access those lines. It's called a key system because the telephones have a set of keys that can be used to access each of the individual lines. And in the case of uh, a lot of modern key systems like the North Star, uh, those keys can be programmed to access other features. Another common feature of a key telephone system, which this one also has, is uh, an intercom feature. You can dial other phones in the system. You don't have to use any outside lines. The system has its own built-in uh, talk path so that one inside phone can call and talk to another inside phone. And uh, we'll demonstrate that in this video as well. As you can probably tell already, the 1A2 is a very different beast from other newer key telephone systems like the North Star or like the uh, Toshiba Strata, which is another electronic key system. Uh, we have such a system at work. And uh, as you can see, the phones look very different. Uh, the operation is quite different, although the core functions are the same. And it's just really, really cool and really fun to play with. The first key telephone system that Western Electric developed for the Bell system uh, was called the 1A and it was a very basic system indeed. It had no method of indication of which lines were in use and it was just very very crude. Just here's a bunch of phones, here's a bunch of lines that are all connected to each phone and you press a button to choose a line and hope for the best. That was the 1A. I don't know if the 1A was the first key telephone system, but it was definitely the first in the United States. And that was in the late 1930s. And then in the 1950s, the 1A was replaced with the 1A1, which was again still a very crude system, although more advanced than the 1A. Indications of line usage and other functions were introduced. And then the 1A2, uh, which is this system, was introduced in 1964 and uh, it became the standard of key telephone systems uh, right into the 1980s and actually uh, many companies used 1A2 systems into the 90s and even some stragglers used them into the 2000s. Reason being was they were bulletproof and if you just had a little operation where you had only a few lines and a few phones and you didn't need any of the advanced features it was perfect. 
And so 1A2 systems kept chugging along for decades in some cases. And actually, all pretty much all of the electronic key systems that succeeded it, in the case of the 1A2 specifically, its direct successor was the AT&T Merlin, those all emulate 1A2 functionality, right down to how lights flash and, and stuff like that. All your electronic key telephone systems sort of give a nod to the 1A2 in a lot of the core functions and how they implemented them. Now, unlike the 1A and the 1A1, which were entirely electromechanical in how they worked, the 1A2 did add some electronic smarts into how the system worked. However, uh, the 1A2 was still very much mechanical in its operation, and uh, I'll talk about that in this video. 1A2 equipment, mainly the telephones themselves, were made by companies other than Western Electric, all the usual companies that uh, made clones of Western Electric uh, stuff. Uh, ITT, Stromberg Carlson, and Northern Telecom. They all made 1A2 phones and they were plug and play compatible. Although uh, in the 1970s, Northern Telecom actually introduced their own key system that functioned like the 1A2, but the phones weren't electrically compatible and it was called the Logic, the Northern Telecom Logic. There was also another key system that actually the Bell system itself sold alongside the 1A2 called the Com Key system. The Com Key system was a key telephone system that did not use a key service unit. There was no key service unit. Basically, you had a main telephone that itself acted as a key service unit, and then all the other telephones connected back to that main telephone. The most common com key systems were a 4x16, four, four lines, 16 phones. The smaller 1A2 systems were 4x8, four, four lines, uh, 8 extensions, um, but you could have systems that were much, much larger. Uh, I don't know exactly how much. Some uh, 1A2 telephone models could handle as many as 29 lines, so that gives you an idea. So let's take a look at the two telephone sets that I have here. I got two identical models, although they were made by different companies, but there were many different types of 1A2 phones that you could get. Uh, one common type was the uh, model 564 and 565. They were actually based on the model 500 telephone and look similar, although an enlarged body. And then likewise, there was the 2564 and 2565, which were based on the model 2500. That's the touchtone version, basically. Again, based on a, a larger body. And uh, you had wall phones, phones designed for hanging on a wall. And then another common type was this type. Uh, these telephones are the model 2830, and they were a common type of uh, ordinary desk phone. You can tell when you're looking at one right away because they're kind of huge. They're this big rectangular slab and I love it. And uh, that's why I uh, was glad to get these particular phones. I mean, in the end, I bought the cheapest, good looking condition uh, 1A2 phones that I could find. But I was really happy to find two of this particular model just because I, I think they look really cool, really uh, industrial in nature and kind of different. So this is a Western Electric 2830 and uh, it was made in 1984 and this is an ITT 2830 and it was made in 1986. So both of these phones were actually made after the breakup of the Bell telephone system. As a matter of fact, this phone doesn't actually say Western Electric or Bell system on it. On the bottom it says uh, AT&T. So it's technically an AT&T 2830, although pretty much all of the internal components say Western Electric. The phone never changed internally, just the name of the company stamped on the bottom was. And then the ITT one, which as you can see is pretty much a copy, although there is uh, some minor differences that uh, I'll point out here in a moment. Of course, the first one is the uh, ITT badge. 
in the corner there. And there was there was a rotary version uh, of these phones, the uh, 830. And this particular model of phone has 10 keys, 9 line keys, and a hold key. In addition to an extra key, which we see here, which was called a recall key. And I'll explain how that works and what it's used for in a bit. There was also a ver version of this phone, the 2831, which had 20 keys, so 19 line keys, and a hold key. And uh, yeah, you could get 1A2 phones with as few as 6 keys, uh, or as many as 30 keys. These ones have 10 keys, that's just what I happen to find. Um, I'll never make use of all those keys because that KSU, which we'll look at in more detail in a bit, it's a 2x4. <laughs> it only takes two outside lines and it can handle four extensions. And then it uses the fifth line for the intercom line. So that button, that button, and that button are the only ones that's used. This and the last four are all useless. The most coveted 1A2 phone is called the Call Director. And uh, yes, uh, Western Electric actually gave it a name rather than just a numerical designation. The Call Director was designed uh, specifically for a central answering position or a front desk position. Uh, you could get them in either 18 or 30 key forms. And it's got a really unique and really cool design that's re a lot different than uh, all the other 1A2 phones. It's a really cool looking phone. Uh, the Call Director uh, was actually originally released for the 1A1 system and then later uh, Western Electric uh, upgraded them to be compatible with 1A2 systems. And it's such a cool looking phone. It's got a big Call Director logo right on it. and. Uh, and they made both rotary and touch tone uh, versions. And funny enough, how the Bell system marketed the 1A2 system was not by marketing the system itself, but by marketing the call director phone in particular. The call director was the uh, golden child of the 1A2 system. All of Bell's marketing materials would be based around the call director. It was marketed towards uh, employees in a business who were in a cent central answering position or perhaps those employees bosses and they would show a sexy picture of the phone and talk about how much easier their job would be if they had a phone that could do all this. So it was always the call director uh, was always how they marketed the 1A2 system and of course they would say contact your your uh, Bell System uh, uh, business products representative to talk about how the call director can help you. Um, and of course, the only way to get a call director phone is through a 1A2 system. And so that's how they sold 1A2 systems. Pretty, pretty neat, actually. But yeah, call director, really neat phone. And if anybody has one that they'd like to give to a good home, let me know, I would love to have a call director phone to use on this system. In that same spirit, if you have an 830, which is the rotary dial version of the 2830, uh, I'd be interested in that too. So before I show off the phones, uh, let me actually get the phones out of the way for a few minutes and talk about that key service unit. Here is the key service unit, and like I said uh, in the beginning of the video, this is not an original Western Electric 1A2 KSU. This is a modern homebrew KSU that a guy down in the United States designed and sells. His name is Greg Ercolano and he runs Saris Corporation. And he designed this solid state microcontroller powered 1A2 KSU as a labor of love. Well, a labor of love that has turned into a, uh, a labor of fruit, because I know he's sold at least a few of these. And uh, you can buy one of these from him. Uh, he doesn't sell phones, but he sells the KSU. Uh, $275 US will get you one of these. Although I went a slightly different route, because I'm cheap as hell, 
and well actually a little bit too poor to spend two hundred and seventy five dollars on something like this I messaged him and I said hey would you consider selling just a bare PCB and then I'll procure the components on my own and solder it up myself and not only was he completely okay with that but he gave me a great price on a bare PCB um, and actually we talked back and forth for several weeks he was super helpful um, he actually uh, showed me components that I could omit if I wasn't going to be using certain features um, components uh, that I could swap out for cheaper versions to save money um, he's super cool dude it gave me all these tips that you know I could reduce the cost of building one of these because he knew that you know money was an object in my case and just super friendly super helpful guy and my goodness did he make one freaking cool thing uh, really really neat so this is actually an older version he, he's constantly improving this KSU and so uh, the bare board he sold me is actually an older revision which is why I was able to uh, get such a great price on it I have revision H1 he's now up to revision uh, J1 I believe and the date of this revision is October 2019 so this is an old revision indeed a year and a half ago and with each revision he uh, you know in a lot of cases he reduces the component count or changes out components to make it um, you know just simpler to assemble or or make it better um, emulate uh, the behavior of, a, of an actual 1A2 key service unit stuff like that and this indeed perfectly replicates an original 1A2 system as we'll see when we start playing with the phones later in this video but yeah he sold me a bare board and I bought all the components and I soldered them myself about 600 solder joints uh, 630 and change if I remember correctly and uh, I did that I did all this over the course of a few evenings just uh, binging YouTube while uh, idly soldering away uh, I got n almost all the components on DigiKey uh, there was one component I had to source on eBay because it's actually a new old stock component that you can't get anymore and there's no modern equivalent it's that chip right there that MT8870DE that's a DTMF decoder chip and I had to buy it on eBay and as you can see the date code on my chip 29th week of 1999 <laughs> so it's a new old stock part indeed but you can get them on uh, uh, you can get them from China for pretty cheap I, I bought that this one from China for like three bucks um, and there's lots of them uh, from China on eBay so lots lots to go around no no worry about that one other part that I sourced on eBay was this which is actually an optional component and I'll, I'll talk about this in a bit but yeah there you go there's the board and uh, I will tell you that the cost of the board and the components uh, about uh, about 150 uh, US dollars and then the two phones I bought added up to about another 150 US dollars so all in all this entire system I spent about 300 bucks on which uh, uh, you know it's a bit of money but also this was back in early January when I was going through a lot of mental turmoil uh, <laughs> in particular a really sad breakup and I just needed a uh, I needed something to keep me busy and it's just something fun to do and this absolutely served the purpose and I have zero regrets on the three hundred dollars I spent to uh, get this whole system uh, no regrets at all super fun um, it just really cool to learn about 1A2 and I do use this system <laughs> which is great so as I said before um, it's a 2 by 4 system two outside lines four phones and the four phones plug 
into these four uh, connectors. It's our old friend, the RJ21 connector. So indeed, each phone, pardon my camera work, each phone has these honking 25 pair cables. Uh, 25 pair, 50 wires in this cable with these big RJ21 connectors that plug into here. And uh, in a bit you'll understand why these phones have cables, 25 pair cables coming out of them rather than just a standard modular jack or whatever. So yeah, it's a 2x4 system. Uh, lines 1 and 2 uh, go to keys 1 and 2 on each phone. And the intercom goes to key 5. Now, the system can actually be expanded to a 4x8. And how you do that is you buy two of these boards and connect them together with a ribbon cable. And what you need to do is uh, there's two pin headers on this board. One of them is being covered by this thing, but you can see this one called secondary and then the other one's called primary. And normally uh, both of these would have, you know, pin headers soldered onto them. And if you want to hook two of these together to expand it to a 4x8, uh, one of the board has the primary headers shorted out with jumpers and the other board has the secondary header shorted out with jumpers. And then right here is where another header would solder on to connect it to the other board. You can see it's called interlink connector. And that's how you do it. And as you can see, these were some of the parts I omitted assembling my board. I left this out and I left this out. And rather than getting jumpers to jump the primary, I just literally took some wires and just soldered each set of two pins together. So uh, I reduced the cost by a few dollars doing that. But yeah, uh, if you want more phones and more lines to play with, that's how you do it. Also notice my board <laughs> has no serial number on it because it wasn't assembled by him. Uh, so presumably all the ones that he assembles have a serial number. <laughs> Mine doesn't because I just bought the bare board. Oh, there's his website. Want more information about this? Oh, let's see if I can get it there. Saris.com slash 1A2-KSU And he has a lot of great information on there. Not just about this project but on uh, the different models of 1A2 phones. He has diagrammed the internal wiring diagrams of 1A2 phones, which is really cool and also a little important for uh, getting the system running. And yeah, really, uh, a really great website. And he has his email address there, which is how you contact them if you want to buy one of these. So what else can this 1A2 board do? Well, it supports pulse or tone dialing. And uh, actually 1A2 itself inherently supports tone or pulse dialing because uh, that's actually uh, dependent on the outside, the support of the outside line rather than the KSU having to support it. And I'll explain uh, why later. Um, on the intercom line, you can buzz extensions. I haven't mentioned that yet. Uh, 1A2 phones have two signaling devices built into them. A standard bell ringer and a buzzer that runs on low voltage AC. Um, and so if you're on an intercom and want to get someone's attention to talk to them, you can buzz them either with a rotary dial or a touch tone dial by dialing the number of the extension that you want to buzz. And that's where the term buzz comes from. That's uh, used in the context of even modern key telephone systems and even IP phone systems. That's, uh, that's where it originated because uh, 1A2 phones literally have a buzzer in them. And so even today, like at work, for example, on our Toshiba Strata system, uh, if I need someone to contact me later, I'll say buzz me, buzz me later, or buzz me when you're done or whatever. Um, it's common vernacular now and it originated with the 1A2, which is kind of cool. 
So this board supports that, and that's why it has this DTMF decoder chip, is when you're on the intercom line and you have a touchtone phone and you want to buzz somebody, this detects what digit you dialed and then passes it to this microcontroller, which initiates the buzzing. Two microcontrollers in this thing, one that's uh, uh, the main microcontroller that controls ringing and and uh, line activity detection and everything like that. And then a second microcontroller that's used for buzzing extensions. And these are PIC microcontrollers. I got them on DigiKey. And uh, I had to program them, of course. And uh, he makes the uh, hex files for programming available on the website. And so I actually went on eBay and I bought a knockoff Microchip Picket 3, which is a really common, really popular PIC microcontroller programmer. I bought a bootleg one on China uh, from China because the original ones are quite expensive, and it worked perfectly. I used uh, Microchip's MP Lab X software. Once I figured out what I had to do, uh, it was easy peasy programming these microcontrollers. And the reason this red LED is constantly flashing is just to tell you that the system is working. If that red LED is flashing, then the microcontroller is functioning, uh, was programmed properly, and is functioning. These yellow LEDs are activity LEDs. Uh, so you don't have to look at a phone. You can look at the KSU itself. You can see if line 1 is active or if line 2 is active, or if the intercom line is being used. Very nice. The board runs at 12 volts DC, which is why I have it at this weird angle, is because I have a cord going all the way over there and back to the back of the wall and back around there to the Numar 12 volt linear power supply, which is what I use to power this thing. It is fused. A 2 amp fuse is recommended, 2.2 amps max. I had a 1 amp fuse on hand, so I stuck that in and it's been perfectly fine. And then. I stuck this switch in there, which I already had in my parts stash. What's that for? Well, uh, one of the cool things about this board is that it has testing facilities on board. So it's got, again, sorry for the angle, but it's got a ring trigger function. So it's got a four position connector and you can hook switches or buttons or relays or whatever to uh, one set of terminals and another to the other set of terminals to trigger the board to, to say that either line one or line two is ringing. So I hooked a switch up to the line one position and I have no phones connected right now, but you'll see if I flip this switch, it's now behaving as if line one is ringing and if you listen you might be able to hear a relay periodically clicking that's the relay which triggers the buzzing and the bell ringing so I'll shut that off and there and so you can trigger either line one or line two to ring. Another cool thing is you have some uh, dip switches right here. And these dip switches let you configure whether the buzzers and or the bells are used for ringing. And you can set which extensions buzz, which extensions ring, which extensions buzz and ring. So you can use the buzzers for general purpose ringing as well, which is cool. Um, and yeah, you can just choose which extension does which kind of ringing on which line. It's fully configurable, which is great. So for example, I have none of the phones set to buzz, and I have extension one set to ring on line one, and extension two set to ring on line two. So there you go. Now, something this board cannot do by itself, you have to buy an optional component to do it, is ring the bell ringers. So in its default base configuration, 
This board can power the buzzers, but not ring the bell ringers. And the reason is because, of course, the bell ringers rely on high voltage AC, 90 volts AC at 20 or 25 hertz. And 1A2 systems, the original 1A2 systems, um, the phones do not ring from the line powered ringing. And the reason for that is because, well, uh, uh, a telephone line, or at least uh, an old fashioned telephone line, can only handle a ringer equivalence number of five, so the equivalent of five bell ringers. Well, a 1A2 system could very well have more than five phones, and then not to mention any phones that are hooked up outside of the 1A2 system, or any auxiliary ringers, or stuff like that. So, 1A2 systems, the original ones, and this one, the phones do not ring from the line power. Uh, you actually have to hook up your own ring generator, which is triggered to turn on uh, when a line rings. So in this board's base configuration, it can't do that. So you have to hook up an external uh, ringer that generates the 90 volts AC. And there's two ways of doing that. One way is uh, you have this external ring generator uh, uh, connection here, which you would have a Phoenix connector on, uh, but I omitted it. And uh, you have your 12 volt ring output, which powers the ringer, and in this case it's marked 105 volts AC 20 hertz input. So whenever uh, a line is ringing, 12 volts uh, is output through here from that relay you heard clicking, and then the uh, high voltage ringing signal generated by the uh, uh, external ring generator goes in through this connection. And actually, uh, he designed this to work with an original Western Electric 1A2 ring generator. So if you have an old school Western Electric 1A2 ring generator, uh, you can hook that up to this. So that's one way to enable bell ringing. The other way to enable bell ringing is through this device, which I bought on eBay. It is a power design ringer. Takes in 12 volts DC, outputs, uh, in this case, 70 volts AC at 20 hertz. Made in Israel. I actually bought this from Israel. It had to be shipped from Israel. It took forever to come. But uh, he actually designed this board specifically to accept this ringer. He uh, put a header specifically for this ringer right on the board. So you can get one of these ringers for 25 bucks, which I think is a pretty good price, and plug it right in. And I have this one stuck to the board uh, with some double-sided tape. And that's how I'm getting my bell ringing. So that's two different ways to get bell ringing on this system. Or, if you don't care about it, you can just use the buzzers and the phones will buzz when an outside line rings. It's up to you. Now, what's this contraption I have going on here? Well, he designed the board to use a single RJ11 jack for both lines, which isn't too far-fetched, although not something you see uh, in a home environment very often. But uh, the single jack handles both lines. Uh, the two middle pins are line one, which is normal, you know, normally in a home setting. Uh, your telephone line comes in just the two middle pins of the four available pins. And then the two outside pins are line two. Um, so how do you deal with this if you have two separate phone cords coming in for the two separate lines that you want to hook up to this thing? Well, you can buy adapters that uh, have a single combined line one, line two connection and uh, have two separate jacks on the other end, a line one and a line two. But what I did was, I took a three tap telephone splitter and split it open. And to my delight, uh, the three female jacks are connected to the single male jack through wires. And this is just uh, a one to three tap. So they were all paralleled with each other. 
So I just cut the wires and internally rewired this thing so that uh, the the middle jack is a combined line one line two that just passes through to this if I had such a thing and uh, I also have separate line one and line two jacks one goes to the middle pins on this male jack and the other one goes to the outside pins on this male jack and uh, the whole contraption just plugs in here and that's how I sorted that out all right, we're on tape two of this debacle. Let's play with some 1A2 phones. Now the reason 1A2 phones have this thick 25 pair cable to connect them to the KSU is because unlike an electronic key system, like the North Star system, where everything is done digitally and thus the phone only has to connect to the KSU with two wires through a standard modular cable, uh, with a 1A2 system, everything is physical. So when you select a line to make a phone call, you're physically connecting to that line. So for each of these keys, you need all the wires necessary to physically connect to that line. Six wires, uh, to be exact. For each key, for each line that you have, six wires are used to connect the phone to that line. Two of the wires are the line itself, tip and ring. So you've got two wires for tip and ring on the particular line. You've got two wires that are lamp and lamp ground to light up the lamp that each key possesses. And then the last two wires are called A and A1. And those are your control leads. Those are what tell the KSU when you're going on a line. When a KSU sees A and A1 connected for a particular line, uh, that's what triggers it to light up the lamp on all the phones to let everyone know that that line is in use. So it's A and A1 in addition to lamp and lamp ground and tip and ring. And phones with more than 10 buttons, like the call director phones, they actually have more than one RJ21 connector uh, at the end of their cable. They can have two or three RJ21 connectors because they can have as many as 75 pairs, which is 150 wires needed to use all the keys if such a situation were to occur. So they, they can actually have two or three RJ21 connectors to connect to the KSU. Each key is lit up with an incandescent lamp, which looks so cool. Uh, actually, let me go on the intercom line right now. Uh, you might not be able to see this very well. Let me turn my iris down. As you can see, I've actually labeled my keys here. So my line one is my personal line that's served by Rogers, and I have it labeled as such. Uh, line two is my public line, 207-952-8919 if you want to send me a fax or uh, leave a message on an answering machine. And then the fifth line is intercom, so I labeled it as such. Same on the other phone. And actually this phone actually came with uh, one of the keys labeled when it was in its original life. COM22, so maybe that was uh, to select the intercom, and this was extension 22, perhaps. And they have little windows here, uh, where on a household phone, you'd put your phone number. But in the case of this one, I've labeled it with the extension numbers. And you select a line by pressing a key. Uh, we'll go on the intercom for a start. And when you lift the handset, it lights up with an incandescent lamp which is so cool and all the phones on the system light up to let everyone know that uh, that line is in use and yeah an incandescent lamp uh, it runs on low voltage AC actually the same power supply that the buzzer is powered by and this particular phone actually has uh, a feature that this one doesn't have called automatic key restoration when I hang up the button automatically mechanically pops back up that's pretty nice if I go on my uh, one of my phone lines here now I'm on the phone line I hear the dial tone I hang up and uh, the key pops back up 
This phone doesn't have that, so if I go back on the intercom line here and I hang up, the key stays down. So to release the key, you can actually use the hold switch or what some people do is they just halfway press another button to, put, to uh, release the latch and let it pop back up. And if this phone didn't have automatic key restoration, you would do the same. But the hold button is not just to restore keys, it actually puts the line on hold. Um, let me demonstrate here. I'll go on my VoIP line and I'll press hold. Oh. And the line is now on hold and as you can see the lamp is doing what's called winking. Wink, wink, wink. And that's one of the things that modern electronic key telephone systems emulate. Uh, their lamps blink the very same way. And as you can see, that happens for all phones. And I can hang up while the line is on hold. And when I'm ready to go back on the line, I just hit the button again. I can also put a line on hold and pick it up from another extension. And I'll hang up, and the line is hung up. Now what about this recall button? Well, let's say you're on a line, you're dialing a call, and you make a mistake. Well, you could hang back up, and then lift the handset up and select the line again. But, there's a possibility that during those few seconds that you're hung back up, someone else might steal the line. And then you gotta got either pick another line or wait for a free line to attempt your call again. Well, that's where the recall button comes in. So when you're on a line and you press the recall button, you are physically disconnected from tip and ring. So the line goes idle, but you're still connected to A and A1 for that line. So the line stays lit. So as long as I'm holding down that recall button, that line is idle, but I still I have still asserted control of the line because everyone can see that the line is in use. So you make a mistake dialing, just press recall, you get a dial tone again, you didn't lose the assertion of your control of the line, and you're able to dial again. Very nice. Same thing on this phone. Go on my Rogers line this time. I hold down the recall button. I am physically disconnected from tip and ring, but I'm still connected to A and A1. Very nice. Not all 1A2 phones have a recall button. These two do, and I think it's quite neat. How about we make a telephone call? Probably a lot of people watching this that have been waiting for that. Now, uh, like I said, I've configured the KSU so that this phone rings when line one rings, and this phone rings when line two rings. So what I'll first do, we'll go off hook on this phone and we'll go on line one and I'm gonna call line two from line one and uh, simply dial the number. Uh, oh, gotta put a one in the beginning on this line. One, two, oh, seven, nine, five, two, eighty-nine, nineteen. And we wait. better make sure it's my call did not go through may I please hang up and try again I don't know why that's going on make sure I have a dial tone I do one two oh seven nine five two eight nine one nine all right and as you can see Standard in a key system, all the phones indicate when a line is ringing by the light flashing slowly. So let's answer the call. We'll answer on this phone. Oh, my, <laughs> my answering machine picked up. But uh, there. So we're now on a call between these two phones. This one on uh, my personal line and this one on my VoIP line. So, a call that's traveling a few hundred kilometers probably, actually not probably, actually a few hundred kilometers to connect two phones sitting 
six inches apart. <laughs> but there you go. And uh, I can put the call on hold here. And uh, so now we have line one on hold and this guy's just waiting for the guy on line one to pick up again. Maybe he'll go on hold too. There, now we got both lines on hold. So we now got both lines on hold. Line one called line two, they're connected together, both lines on hold, and maybe while both lines are on hold, somebody goes on the intercom line. And now we pick up the intercom line, and now we have as many lights lit up as we can have lit up in this uh, uh, configuration. So perhaps I'll go on back on this line, or perhaps I'll put it on hold, and I'll go on line two. And now we'll put this guy on line one. And now they've switched places a few hundred kilometers apart. They've now changed positions. This guy on line one, this guy on line two. I'll put line one on hold. But now I'm going to hang up line two. And this KSU actually has disconnect supervision. So if a line is on hold and it goes dead, it knows to release that line. So I currently have line one on hold. And I'm going to hang up line two, and line one, the, the lamp for line one is also going to go out because uh, the line has gone dead. So I'm going to hang up on line two, person on line two hung up, and now line one uh, clears because there's no longer a call on it. Pretty nice, nice function built into that, very smart, very cool. Let's call line one so you can hear this phone ring. Uh, you'll also hear my Northern Telecom M9316 over here ring, but that's okay. So let's uh, go on line two, and we'll call my personal line, which I will not show you the number for. And now this phone will ring, hopefully. There you go. And we'll answer it before my answering machine picks up. And once again, we have another call in progress. Now, how about we go on the intercom line and use one phone to buzz the other phone directly. So to buzz the phones, you literally just dial the extension. So this phone's extension 1. So I would dial ex uh, uh, 2 to, to buzz this phone. How about that? And there you go, 60 hertz AC at 10 to 12 volts. Very cool. And uh, I'll hang up here and I'll buzz this phone. And I actually did a little modification to this phone that some people do. Um, this phone is lucky enough to have been designed with uh, individual lamp ground for each lamp. So I took the hold key, which has a socket for a lamp, but by default doesn't have a bulb in it. I stole the bulb from this key and put it in here, and I wired it in parallel with the buzzer. So I buzz the phone, and the hold key lights up. How nice is that? The ITT, unfortunately, uh, has a common lamp ground, uh, so I can't do that. I can't uh, hook up a lamp for the hold key. Or maybe I might, but I don't know if it would screw with anything, but I haven't tried it. And uh, yeah, nice little 60 hertz buzzer. And uh, you can actually go inside the phone and adjust the volume of the buzzer by turning a screw, which is nice. And if you want to buzz all four extensions at once, you dial zero. And if you're all alone, and you have nobody else to play telephone with, you can buzz yourself. <laughs> I love it. Now, obviously these two phones are touch tone, but you can buzz extensions with a rotary phone. Uh, the microcontroller uh, detects the pulses and uh, does a one second buzz. Now, I don't have a rotary phone to demonstrate that with, but we can use the recall key because it does the exact same thing. Uh, tap it once, and it's uh, equivalent to pulse dialing a one. Oh. 
Oh, you know what? I gotta take this phone off the line. Yeah, oh! I never realized that. So that's a little bit of a limitation. Uh, rotary dialing to buzz an extension only works if there's one phone on the line. Ah, I didn't realize that until now. And then I'll tap it twice. And this phone buzzes. So, there you go. That's buzzing extensions. And if you want, I will turn off bell ringing. And I'll turn on buzzer ringing for extension one, this extension. And uh, for, for both lines. And so let's uh, make another call from one line to another. Oh, I gotta dial a one. See that? I'll hang up. And it takes it a second to realize that the line's no longer ringing, but it gets there. Now, you want to really annoy people or yourself? Let's turn on buzzers for both phones and bells for both phones. And now let's make a phone call. Oh. Every time I am so ham-fisted tone dialing. There you go. Well that folks is, I believe, all there is to show of my 1A2 key telephone system with the modern homebrew 1A2 key service unit by Saris Corporation. There will be links in the description below to his website if you want to learn more about this or order one. And you haven't seen the last of this system. I do want to make a follow-up video where we'll actually look inside the phones and we'll discuss the phones more from a technical standpoint. Now, what do I want to do with this system? Well, I've, as you can plainly see, I've already got both lines hooked up to it. Not sitting here on the coffee table, though. What I've been doing is I actually have the KSU hanging on the wall. You can see back there. And then I've had the two phones sitting beside each other over there. The reason I've had it that way is because, well, these cords aren't very long. What I'd like to do is have one extension on my computer desk next to the computer and another extension in the bedroom. Um, but obviously I can't do that. I mean, they don't make RJ21 extension cords, and if they did, they would be uh, enormously expensive. But there is a solution to that. Uh, Greg Ercolano, who makes the board, also makes an accessory for the board that is a set of breakout adapters that turns one of these RJ21 connectors into three Ethernet ports. And so what you can do is plug your phone into uh, one part of this adapter and then plug the other part of the adapter into the KSU and the adapters uh, and the two parts of the adapter connect to each other with three Ethernet cables. So I have no idea what he charges for those. I haven't contacted him about it yet. But I'm thinking in the future that's what I want to do is get a set of those adapters because then you can connect a phone long distance to the KSU uh, with three Ethernet cables and you know uh, Cat5 cable is super cheap um, and so you know uh, take about 
no, oh, I, I, I forget what I calculated it to now, something like 50 or 75 feet of uh, Cat5 cable to go from the KSU to the side table in my bedroom. And then you'd need three um, uh, cables, so uh, I think it was 50 feet, so I'd need 150 feet of Cat5 cable. And you can buy a box of 250 feet of Cat5 cable on Amazon for like 30 or 40 bucks, so not bad at all. But yeah, that's something I might do in the future. Or I might wait until I live in a bigger space uh, where I have more room to try something like that. But that's my, uh, that's my plan with this thing. So, for now, Thank you very much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed uh, learning about the 1A2 key telephone system and the history and the technology behind it, learning about my particular system and the stuff you can do, and I hope you found it interesting and fun. I certainly find it very fun. And until next time, I'll see you later. Thank you so much.